All movement is to invisible music, although few people hear it. It comes from the sun and the wind, and the movement of water, and a running rabbit and a crowing cock. And together it is part of a great symphony. The longer we listen, and the quieter we are, the more we hear. And when we do hear, we are part of the music, instead of an unwelcome interruption. In the 1940s, Walter Anderson began a series of journeys to Horn Island, a narrow strip of sand and pine off the coast of Mississippi. From his home in Ocean Springs, he would cross the 14 miles to the island in his small boat, staying for weeks at a time. He called himself the Islander. He moved with the seasons. He moved with the sun and the moon and the tide. He didn't accept any kind of limitations, um, any kind of restrictions on his um, time and behavior. At night, he slept beneath his overturned boat. During the day, he painted countless watercolors of his beloved island. He had incredible technique. He drew like an angel, and he could handle watercolor as so though it was coming out of his fingers, you know. It was, but for him, painting was an entirely personal thing. He looked at images, and he translated them into art as naturally as he digested food. In fact, he uses that metaphor again and again. This is like food for me. If you searched uh, the history of American art for the intersection point of two really strong currents, one of which is fabulous, famous, important Western civilization, uh, European culture, the stuff Thomas Jefferson loved and that art museums try to show us and education tries to teach us. And the other side, the sort of folkloric up from the bottom, um, rooted in the soil, regional, unpre unpredictable appearance out of pure Americana. That folk art and that high culture, he's right at the intersection, he's both. And he was a seeker, and that's in a very familiar American quality. And if you see that sort of mystical seeking thing, he joins a whole other group of um, American visionary seer seekers, Columbus. Johnny Appleseed, you know, Jack Kerouac, he hit the road. He rode his rusty bicycle on thousand mile trips from Mississippi to New York, Pennsylvania, and Florida. He walked across war-torn China, and he searched the world for the point where nature and art become one. He believed, I think, that, you know, somewhere Further down the road, he would find the enlightenment he sought. And this is a religious quest as well as an aesthetic quest. No one in Ocean Springs knew that the town eccentric, with his mismatched clothing and paint-stained hands, was quietly creating artwork that would be celebrated in the years to come. After his death in 1965, even his family was surprised by what they found when they opened the door to his small cottage. There, behind a padlocked door hidden away from the world, was the story of one of America's most enigmatic and passionate artists. Walter Anderson was born in New Orleans on September 29, 1903. He was the second son of George Walter Anderson, a successful grain merchant. 
and Annette McConnell Anderson, a recent graduate of Newcomb College Art School. A talented painter, she encouraged her three children, Peter, Walter, and Mac, to be creative and to see art in the world around them. She was a matriarchal figure for sure and had a certain amount of control over, <laughs> over everyone. And she thought that art, that the creative life, was the best kind of life you could have that it was the most important thing you could do to express yourself through art. At the same time, his father was taking him out into the Louisiana marshes with the other two boys. Totally involved emotionally with the natural world. Once, when Walter was a toddler, he woke up from a dream, laughing that some kind of animal was taking care of him. Later, he said that he wanted to be an angel when he grew up and fly all about the sky and see the eggs in the birds' nests. At school, Walter, whose nickname was Bob, was fascinated by mythology and tales of epic adventure, but not necessarily academic study. He had a keen intellect, but spent hours making maps of the wilderness he explored with his father on weekends. In 1915, Walter and his older brother Peter were sent to a military boarding school in New York. Though Peter excelled there, Walter would describe it later as four years of prison, claiming that the experience had nearly destroyed him. One day after returning home from boarding school, Walter set out sailing by himself on the Mississippi Sound. As a storm blew in, the keeper of the Lakebourne Lighthouse saw Walter's boat a mile and a half out, empty and adrift. The next morning, Walter's parents read in the paper, Tide sweeps boy in small boat to death. Two days later, Walter arrived at home, dressed in rags and hungry. I could eat the shadow of a bean, he said. During the storm, his tiller had come loose, and he jumped into the choppy water to retrieve it. After watching his boat drift away, he'd swum two miles to a channel beacon, where he remained for 28 hours. Finally, dehydrated and nearly unconscious, he was rescued by a passing fisherman. It was thriller enough to last me a lifetime, he told his mother. Little did he know. It was only the beginning. Walter's father had hoped that one of his sons would follow him into the grain business. However, as the boys got older, it became clear that they would follow a different path. In 1922, he gets a scholarship to study art. He went to the New York School of Fine and Applied Art, which is now known as Parsons. But after a year, he was ready for some study of the fine arts, and he enrolled at the Pennsylvania Academy, which was a different world for him. While he was there, he drew. He drew and drew and drew. He was the first generation of trained American art school product who really had studied photographs of canonical art history. So he knew what the Parthenon looked like, and he knew what the uh, palace and, and Knossos looked like, and he knew what the overdoors of French chateaux looked like, and he knew what palaces and castles and new uh, classical and Greek revival buildings looked like, and he put all this in his art. The chain is unbroken. You know, he's learning how to draw the exactly same, the same way Michelangelo learned how to draw. It goes back. You're looking at the culmination of 500 years of learning. His favorite instructor was Henry McCarter, who taught his students that the best artists had done their finest work in defiance of the academy and in defiance of formal training. What mattered most was the artist's faith in his or her own convictions. My father began looking for, searching for a perspective from which to be an artist, a perspective from which to paint. It was a state of awareness. His whole life was a process of looking for 
this perfect perspective. In 1927, he won a travel scholarship, which allowed him to visit the art museums and cathedrals of Europe. It also provided the opportunity to visit a mystic he'd become interested in, George Ivanovich Gurdjieff. Gurdjieff was a mustached um, person from the Caucasus who came and picked up on a tradition much abroad in the British and European upper classes, a kind of promise that he could de deliver through discipline, effort, and sort of arcane uh, ceremonial, the wisdom of the East. Anderson visited the Institute for the Harmonious Development of Man, Gurdjieff's center of learning at Fontainebleau. It's unclear how long he stayed or if he met the master, but later, Gurdjieff's ideas would come back to haunt him. Many um, seekers of his and the previous generation, like, you know, William Yates or Conan Doyle, also followed people that promised the wisdom of the East. And uh, it's like people doing yoga or studying Zen, you know, it's, it's part of America that search. They do New Yorker cartoons, of people going up to the mountains, you know, tell me the true answer to reality. And he actually tried to live out one of those cartoons. He went to the caves, the Paleolithic caves in France. Uh, and that was a much more moving experience for him. Um, when Picasso visited those Paleolithic caves, his, his response was, we've never done anything new. And my father experienced the same kind of intense response to that Paleolithic art. For why does man live? To be a justification to the little black and white ducks? To count the stars and keep them in their place? To be the servant and a slave to all the elements? Art is incredible stuff, not for itself, but in changing the artist's relation to other things. Perspective. While Walter was in Europe, major changes were afoot at home. His mother had begun setting up an art business for the family on the Mississippi Gulf Coast. It was Annette's grand idea to bring the whole family to Ocean Springs, to this rather idyllic spot in the, in the woods on the coast, um, and to have the family devote itself to art. It was a very subversive, very revolutionary idea. Um, she also turned her back on society life in New Orleans, which did not interest her. She had decided long ago that her three sons would have a very special relationship with, with art. Walter's older brother, Peter, was becoming a master potter. And with the help of the family, he was building a business that he would name Shearwater. Shearwater pottery would provide Peter, Walter, and Mac with a way of making a living as artists, sustaining the family through difficult times. Unfortunately, when he returned from the academy in 1928, and went to work in the family pottery. You know, he worked for a, a very enjoyable year or two as a decorator of pottery. And the depression struck. And one of the ways that Shearwater pottery survived was by opening an annex in 1931, an annex that would be devoted to producing inexpensive uh, ceramic pieces, figurines, that, that would be very popular, especially in the North, but also among local customers, um, and they could be mass produced. Bob's life turned into uh, the mass production of these widgets. He called them widgets. He felt like a widget maker. Um, 
he didn't he he loved design and he loved designing these widgets but he hated the actual mechanics of producing them right now i am a drudge after i leave the workshop i am dead it's impossible for me at any rate to shift from pots to painting and then back to pots in the flash of an eyelid that's what i've been trying to do someday i'm going to give up everything else and just paint for a while. Peter had begun dating Pat Grinstead, whose family home, Oldfields, was a short distance down the coast. Walter met Pat's sister, Sissy, who was home from college for the summer. I think when she met him, she was in love with the notion of art, per se, and in fact said so. Uh, I think when she was asked to go on a blind date, the, the deciding factor was he's an artist. Well, she was an extremely well-educated woman. She had uh, gone to what we would call prep school in a uh, school in France. She had done her freshman year at the Submon. She graduated from Radcliffe. So she had a great fine arts, liberal arts background. And uh, she was extremely well-read as he was. And all these things just brought them together. They had this kind of substructure of, uh, of the arts. My summer at Oldfields was short that year, but we spent part of every day with the Anderson boys. They were beautiful days. We went on swimming parties and picnics. We explored the countryside. We sailed the bayous and the sound. How much I did learn and what happiness I enjoyed. By the end of the summer, it was time for Sissy to return to college. My dear, somehow your letters always surprise me. They never come when I'm expecting them. The letter this morning Dear Bob, very... what is it that makes an island so fascinating? Your last letter had some Horn Island plans that will keep me thinking about you for some time. I wish I were going with you this morning. I've been out to look at morning. the sunset, and I was a fool to do it. How can I enjoy anything unless you are there to enjoy it with me? I suppose eventually I'll resign myself to quietly waiting for you to come your down. Letter, and I do miss you, Bob. I miss you a lot. Sissy. I think she was just overwhelmed with the, the force of his passion for art. And then I think she was totally enamored of, his, of the beauty that, that he apprehended in nature. As he made widgets, he dreamt of uh, marrying Sissy. I mean, the idea really was to, um, to gather enough resources so that they could get married, which they did in, in spring of 1933. You know, in the early, early days of their marriage, they had such a wonderful time together, creating furniture and curtains and vases and all sort of objet d'art for their own um, cottage. They had, they had a wonderful beginning. She said that being with Walter Anderson was like having intense sunlight concentrated on everything. A little uncomfortable <laughs> sometimes. One day, Walter didn't come home from work. Sissy began to worry, and by nightfall, when he still hadn't come home, she became frantic. The next morning he returned, covered in marsh mud. He told Sissy what had happened. As he went out the road toward the workshop, he chanced to look up into the empty sky above the marsh. There, in a great drift of white against the pale blue sky, was a flock of birds. The morning sun was shining across the moving wings. They were flying east into the light. They were all over the point and on the water. They were white pelicans. He wasn't close enough, so he waded straight out, swam where the water deepened, and soon found himself among the great creatures. He watched them all day and most of the night until they flew off into the moonlight. Then, of course, he came home. As long as I live, he said, I shall never forget it. In 1934, he won a commission 
through the Public Works of Art program to paint a series of murals for the Ocean Springs school system. Over the next few years, Walter continued to apply for mural commissions. He was looking for a way of making a living as a painter, and the PWA seemed to be the perfect solution, combining his love of painting with public art. After he finished the Ocean Springs Public School mural, he probably thought that he deserved a long holiday. In the summer of 1935, he made this remarkable trip with Sissy. And the two of them took a greyhound to um, Louisville. And they decided that they would return home by floating down the Ohio and the Mississippi from um, Louisville to New Orleans. They established a routine canoeing 25 miles a day on average, camping along the riverbank. One night after crossing into Tennessee, Walter went to bed too sick to eat. The next morning he was delirious, unable to walk or move. Terrified, Sissy managed to get him into the canoe and to the care of a doctor. He was diagnosed with malaria This illness lingered for a long time. And during this period of illness, he developed undulant fever. So he had, you know, those two illnesses. While ill, he continued to paint and apply for commissions. He was devastated when a mural he'd been preparing for the Jackson Courthouse was rejected. And then, on March 23rd, 1937, his father died of stomach cancer. Walter was distraught, overwhelmed with grief. He sank into a state of extreme despair and depression. After these three or four um, life-altering events, uh, he, he became psychotic in, in uh, spring of 1937. The mind is a serpent moving slowly while the quick birds fly overhead, scolding its slowness. Once it was a turtle, protected from the birds by its shell. Now its strength is its only protection. It longs for the night and the end of the world, the rising sea, or some catastrophe which will destroy its pain. He was taken to the Johns Hopkins um, hospital, the Henry Phipps Psychiatric Clinic, and he remained there for 18 months. He was placed under the care of Dr. Adolf Meyer, whose reputation as a leading figure in modern psychiatry had attracted one of the finest medical staffs in the country. The diagnosis was profound depression, but it was a very serious, extremely serious mental illness, which altered his whole, the course of his life. While at Phipps, Anderson was tormented by a memory. Obeying some impulse um, with, with other people in the family present, he slays this sea turtle. And when he had his breakdown, he was acutely conscious of this death of the death of that turtle. He remembered that incident. And um, Sissy says, it's in his hospital records, that he sobbed remembering that, that turtle. In 1938, after a year and a half of treatment, Walter said he was sick of doctors. With the consent of Dr. Meyer, he was released. We took Bob home. He was terribly uncertain. His books, his pictures, even music seemed to frighten him. He wandered in the woods, coming in at intervals. He did not want to take a bath or change his clothes. No one seemed to be able to talk to him. He would not read the letters sent by his doctors. He seemed lost in a pervasive sorrow. Sissy. He was rehospitalized this time at the Mississippi State Hospital in Whitfield. 
It was the beginning of a year of hospitalization and of escape. He named himself uh, and drew uh, a rather stunning image of himself when he was in one of the mental hospitals. Uh, a picture, a hor horrific picture of himself, uh, seated on the floor with his back against the wall and his legs splayed and the whole posture uh, pretty grim. And he labeled that uh, in Spanish, the alienado, the, the, the alienated. At the Mississippi State Hospital, Walter again became sick of doctors. But this time, when he was ready to return home, he did not ask for permission. When he escaped from Whitfields, he lowered himself to the ground from a second story window. Using the classic method, he tied bed sheets together. But the interesting part of the story is that when patients assembled on the lawn the next day, and I suppose saw the sheets flapping in the wind, they also saw birds drawn on the brick walls with ivory soap, birds in flight. After a few months at home, Anderson was admitted to another hospital, this time at Shepherd Pratt in Baltimore. One day while being supervised in the library, Anderson walked calmly across the hospital grounds and disappeared into the trees. Three months later, he reappeared, thin and bearded, at Shearwater. He'd followed the railway tracks home. Walter had walked over a thousand miles. The fact that the man suffered mental illness very much a part of who he was. I know that when you're mentally ill, you are cracked open. And it makes you much more vulnerable to everything. One meaningful element in the psychosis to me is um, his regret for having hunted and his regret for having killed animals and for having painted dead animals. And like Audubon, he worked with dead specimens. And when he emerges from uh, the hospital, his attitude towards the natural world is very different. It's no longer um, that of a hunter or uh, a fisherman. There is a striking drawing and it shows a hunter pointing a gun, a rifle, at a stag, and an angel comes down and grabs the barrel of that rifle and presses downward, and another angel is helping the stag escape from the hunter. But it's really part of a major change in his, in his relationship with nature. He was totally aware of the interconnectedness, totally sure that human beings were not observers of nature, but a part of nature and it was all happening to us, but we seem oblivious to, to that reality. Sissy writes, he's building a tree house in the tallest pine on the place. He goes up one step every day. His mother asks him, why are you building that tree house? And he says, I'm going to heaven. <laughs> um, he, he asks Sissy, would you like to join me? Today, looking back, we can understand why he built that treehouse. It makes so much sense at that point in his life. Many of his drawings of this period look down on Shearwater um, as though he were gaining a different sense of perspective or, or looking at things from a different perspective. But imagine him driving these cross ties into that pine tree and imagine the rest of the family trying to keep, trying to balance their concern and their love for him with, with, um, with the need to give him freedom. Uh, it was extremely difficult and it would be for the rest of his life. While Walter had been ill, he and Sissy had two children together, Mary and Billy. In 1940, they moved to Sissy's family home, Oldfields, where they had two more children, Leif, 
named for Leif Erikson and John. Old Fields would be their home for the next seven years. During those years, he came back to the human race from that far-off journey of his as much as he was ever to do. Light and happiness entered our lives again. Uh, there's a bio in Gocek, old bio in a mark probably, and uh, I think he took me and Mary there. Uh, we swam in this bio and, and we, uh, we'd blow bubbles, put our lips down to the water and blow little bubbles, you know, and he, he taught us this and he thought that was funny. We were all three together and uh, the little mammals would come up and nibble at your lips, the little mammals in the water. You, that's a good memory. Bob often spoke of a day as halcyon. Perhaps despite the war and the tensions, those years at Oldfields were halcyon years for both of us. Bob loved the farming and the gardening. He had never before lived in the country, never near a farm. Suddenly he found himself observing the seasonal changes, ecstatic at the strange brightness of the world and its creatures in the spring. He began to draw and paint in a sort of ecstasy. Sissy. This was a transitional phase for him, and it led him, he recovered his strength. He, he did marvelous work at Old Fields. It was an intensely productive period. He taught himself to draw in a different way, and um, he taught himself to paint in a different way. It says everything he sees were a gong, and he went boing and the thing reverberated and sent out ripples of intention or meaning or memory. I mean, some of the stuff goes on like wallpaper. He's got this weird artistic kind of shimmer in his art, you know. He doesn't, he's not satisfied with the line. He's got to have the echo of the line and the echo of the line. And he's much less interested in the sort of static 3D thing in front of him than the vibrations. He carved statues out of driftwood, decorated pottery, and using inexpensive materials like linoleum from the hardware store, Walter made some of the largest block prints ever produced. There are some artists from whom it just pours out. This guy couldn't stop. You know, I bet if he was um, sitting at a table waiting for a phone call to ring, he would have drawn something. If I gave him the stick and he was sitting by the sea, he would have scratched in the sand. Seems to me that he just kept producing this stuff. Not for a market, not because other people wanted to see it, not to show it to other people. But I think that there was some, some part of the vibration was seeing these dreams take form, making the invisible visible. I think he got into these um, states of exhilaration and states of, um, you know, touching God. That period at Oldfields was so crammed with tremendous amounts of work that I was never able really to believe what I was seeing. How he accomplished it, I don't know. Except that for some reason during that whole period, he rarely slept. Day after day, I expected him to collapse into bed at nightfall. Night after night, after the evening meal, he drew the lamp close at the dining room table, spread out a book, seized his drawing block, pen and India ink. Far into each night, he read and illustrated, virtually translating literature into line drawings, Dante's Divine Comedy, Milton's Paradise Lost, The Iliad and the Odyssey, Darwin's Voyage of the Beagle, and many others. His favorite novel was Don Quixote. He would just um, do a drawing when it struck him, and Don Quixote struck him a lot. <laughs> he, I don't know, there must be over a thousand. He was so steeped in literature, in his reading, in his, in his art, that at this period um, he was studying and reading um, voraciously. He was seeing 
mythology around him. He saw, he looked at that muddy gulf uh, in back of old fields and he saw <laughs> the wine dark sea of uh, Ulysses. In 1947, he left Old Fields and moved back into the cottage at Shearwater. He had to go. And I think that finally he made me understand that it was true, that life was composed of more than one life, and that the only life that would keep him alive was the creative life. She believed in his perceptions and his need for painting and, and, and being uh, completely relieved of, of what we call the ordinary responsibilities of life. He just, he just couldn't handle the pressures, and she knew that. In the cottage, he's able to devote himself entirely to writing, study, drawing, painting, carving, pottery decoration, um, entirely and uninterruptedly, you know, to the things he, he most loves. And he also has the freedom, again, it's a gift given to him by his family. He has the freedom to take his thousand mile bike trips and to uh, travel to Horn Island um, and to lead, to lead that kind of that kind of life, you know, to, to allow himself to be led by his art and by his interests, um, by his intellectual curiosity. This curiosity led him to the Chandelier Islands, a pelican nesting ground 30 miles off the coast. On one trip, he lived amongst the birds for three weeks, eventually returning home with hundreds of sketches and notes for a dictionary of pelican sounds. After you have lived on the island for a while, there comes a time when you realize that the pelican holds everything for you. It has the song of the thrush, the form and understanding of man, the tenderness and gentleness of the dove, the mystery and dynamic quality of the night jar, and the potential qualities of all life. In a word, you lose your heart to it. It becomes your child and the hope and future of the world depends upon it. When he wasn't exploring the islands of the Gulf, he was traveling the country by bicycle, painting and writing along the way. He traveled from Mississippi to Texas, Florida, and New York. On one trip, after visiting friends in Philadelphia, Anderson hopped on his bike and began pedaling for home. He rode over 1,100 miles back to Ocean Springs, covering the same ground he'd traveled after his escape from Shepherd Pratt 15 years earlier. He slept by the side of the road, in abandoned sheds and in the woods. On all of his trips, Walter kept meticulous journals. He called them logs which was a reference to one of his favorite kinds of reading, the records kept by explorers and naturalists. I think all of them were written in dime store composition books. Most of them were weather beaten, had been wet, uh, torn, faded, uh, very hard to decipher in many cases. They, they are a I guess the indispensable source because they are, so far as I know, the uh, longest uh, continuous expression of his mind over a period of about 20 years. Sissy and the children moved into a house on Shearwater, and though they lived very close to Walter's cottage, he was spending more and more time alone. I remember she brought us up when my father behaved peculiarly or when he was not what we hoped he would be. She would say, he's an artist, 
And I was perfectly sure at that time that there were other children, other places, whose fathers were artists like mine. Now I'm not so sure that's true. <laughs> he danced in his house at night and you could hear the loud stompings and thumpings and cavortings. We were only about a block's distance. Well, it, this road here was not paved at the time, but I remember we came in one night uh, in the car and down, and especially in the low place down there, that was all just sand across there. And I got to where I would notice the bicycle tracks and I would know what condition he was in by noticing how he came in on the bicycle, you know. And so we came in one night and it was about, probably about eight o'clock at night. Uh, we had been somewhere in town or Biloxi maybe. And I noticed the, the bicycle track going through the sand down at the, down in the road there. And then it went off the, <laughs> the track went off the road, you know, and my mama stopped and we looked down and, and he was laying down there in the marsh, you know, with that bicycle mostly on top of him. <laughs> on his back, he had gone off the road and gone down the marsh. And uh, well, he wasn't in too good shape that night. <laughs> in 1948, 49, when the art world was becoming aware of him, he received a letter inviting him to uh, to exhibit his linoleum block prints, which were the largest ever made by an American artist at the Brooklyn Museum. About this same time, he inherited some money. For years, he had dreamed of visiting China. So instead of attending the opening of the Brooklyn Museum show, which would have been for any other artist, you know, the beginning of a career, um, in art in New York. He hopped on his bicycle, he cycled to New Orleans, he got a train from New Orleans to Los Angeles, he got on a Pan Am clipper um, and flew to China. He, his idea was to walk as far north as he could or travel as far north as he could and turn east into Tibet and see the uh, the murals in Tibetan monasteries, because he was always very interested in, in Tibetan painting. I walked west. I bought a yellow ear of roasted corn and ate lunch. The road was clear before me. The weeks of argument and coaxing, begging and cunning arrangement were over. It was now simply a matter of endurance, economy, and following a plainly marked road. People don't go to walk across China looking for the, you know, Tibetan masters sitting up on some ice peak except in, you know, Lost Horizon or the life of Walter Henderson. He actually tried to do that. In September 1949, Sissy received a telegram. Money and passports stolen. Send passage home. I'd been told that when he left for New Orleans, he was riding his ancient bike. A few days after I sent the money, he returned the same way. It was late evening when he arrived at the barn. My God, how worn he looked, how terribly thin he was. What would he say back from the ends of the earth? Had a flat tire, he said casually. Though he never made it to Tibet, Walter returned with a new way of working with watercolor. He began painting on typing paper, which he used as a kind of cheap portable canvas. And he used whatever paint he could find while traveling. To Walter, these limitations were liberating. China is a strange and incredible place to an American who has not learned to accept resignation as the chief virtue. In 1951, Walter walked into the newly constructed Ocean Springs Community Center. He looked at the bare, 90-foot-long concrete walls and knew immediately what he wanted to do. A deal was made. He would be paid the sum of one dollar to paint a mural for the community center, and he would provide his own supplies. 
He worked on the murals for over a year. It was his gift to the community. But not everyone appreciated Anderson or his art. To some residents, the murals were nothing more than the doodlings of a mad artist, and it was suggested by one person that they be covered with white paint. Most people avoided Daddy. They found his intensity to be disturbing. They found his alternative way of experiencing life to be somewhat threatening. They knew that he was doing something different. Um, and they did not approve of one person stepping out from the crowd. When I was first able to see Horn Island, it was floating way up in the air and only came down when I started out towards it. The clouds in the direction of the island formed a sort of illuminated ladder, small end on the island which was most appropriate, only celestial beings able to reach it. Providence made an exception in my case, and the island was lowered back to the horizon. The world of man is far away, and so is man. How pleasant without him. Most of the time he would disappear. You'd see him going down the road out here with a wheelbarrow, and loaded with provisions and, and go to his sailboat. And you would know, he's going again. He would stay out there for two or three weeks at a time. Um, often he would only stay in home for a week or so in between his island, island jaunts. That was clearly his place. In this day of the machine age, even a one-mile row is considered an incredible feat. They gave him an outboard motor, you know, to try to help him do the whole thing. And he went down there and he put it on the back of his boat and he pulled it one time and it just didn't work. So he unbolted it and just dropped it right into the harbor. He was thinking, there's one more thing to take care of. There's one more thing to be dependent on. You know, self-reliance. He was self-reliant in his art and I think he was self-reliant in his being. He didn't let a, lot of, let a lot of stuff get in the way. He was going around the tip of Horn Island in a very strong current when his boat turned over. It was rough. He had all his precious art supplies, all of his camping supplies. All went to the bottom. And Walter, as was his habit, immediately divested himself of all his clothes and began swimming for shore. But he said he felt that this was the time of all times that he couldn't make it. He said, I'm, I've, I've got to give up. I just can't make it. But then some little inner voice said to him, but I'll put my feet down first. So <laughs> he put his feet down and found it was only knee deep. And just as he put his feet down, he saw a large shrimp trawler come and he hailed them. He said, please trawl right here at the foot of Horn Island. I've lost everything. They trawled and brought up every single thing that he had. And then they went out and brought his boat back to him so that he was able to continue that camping trip. I survived the terrors of the sea and saw the red sun go down to come to this place to paint. All nature appreciates my courage and love. When he was on the island, he engaged in progresses. His word for wading, crawling, and swimming with the creatures of Horn Island in order to paint them in their own environment. He drew while up to his chest in water, or perched on the branch of a tree, or crouched beside a lagoon. He was totally open to whatever came. The island presents you with opportunities. He often referred to it as a feast of images. When he was referring to those images, he sometimes spoke of an, an embarrassment of riches. Um, there was so much here, so much here to see, so much here to do, that he felt blessed. He felt, um, as he wrote, that he was fortune's favorite child, that he had been given a special dispensation. 
to perceive things more fully, to um, live more intensely. This morning I drew bulrushes while the flies stung. Later I made a watercolor under my boat while the rain poured. Such is the life of an artist who prefers nature to art. He really should cultivate his art more, but feels his love of art will take care of itself as long as it has things to feed on. He came to the conclusion that uh, the artist needs nature to fulfill himself, but that also nature needs the artist because the artist is nature's means of expression. It's, it's nature's means of expressing its order. So when he uses the word realize, I think what he means is that when he realizes he's discovering an order that was there but that wouldn't have been noticed were it not for the attentive eye and the uh, definite knowledge of the artist. After a lifetime of searching, he'd found his perfect perspective. It was a process. Um, the art itself was not the object. It was the process of appreciating nature more fully. Man begins by saying, of course, before his senses have a chance to come to his aid with wonder and surprise. The result is that he dies, and his neighbors and friends murmur with the wind, of course. In September 1965, Hurricane Betsy entered the Gulf of Mexico. He always wanted to be on Horn Island in a hurricane. He stayed on Horn Island during Betsy. We phoned the Coast Guard. The Coast Guard went out twice, but they could only see his boat. I suppose he had hidden himself from them. But he had chosen for his camp a spot where the dunes were highest of all. As the water rose for the hurricane, he went up with his boat. But he didn't have to go to the highest dune, but he tied his boat and himself to the tree and spent the night of Betsy during the hurricane. And the tide receded, and he was perfectly safe. My camp was gone. The place where I had nested snugly for years was gone, simply sliced off by the waves. This was Anderson's last trip to Horn Island. I used to think of his way of experiencing the world as a childlike sense of wonder, the way a child uh, sees the universe in some dust motes drifting in a, um, a shaft of sunlight. And that child is completely awed by the experience. That's the way Walter Anderson lived his life, moving from one shaft of sunlight to another. Walter Anderson died of lung cancer on November 30th, 1965. Sometime after the funeral, I went to his cottage. Everything was in disorder, but I began to realize that the place was bursting with treasures. The hearth and surrounding floor were littered with hundreds of watercolors. The fireplace, full of ashes, attested to his habit of culling his work. It was impossible to guess how much he had destroyed during his lifetime, but what was there was overpowering. All the work he had done over years and years, concentrated in one spot. Work from his student days to the last sketches I had brought from the hospital. There, in the dirty, crumbling cottage, was a truly rare thing almost the complete works of an artist. Later, my sister and I opened the door of a small room that had been hidden away from us. 
Baba kept a padlock on the door. When we looked in, we found that a miracle had taken place. When my sister first went in, she exclaimed, Creation at sunrise. All that we found in the cottage is testimony to his realization, his torment, and his exultation.